<laughs> so no. It's a it's a subscription now. It's like fifteen dollars a month. Oh. Pretty smart on there for it. All right, we are live, and I'm turning on live on Instagram. Okay, we are live. Let's uh, give everybody a minute to kind of join here. I can actually see Instagram as well. But let's keep it going. Got about four people on so far. All right, let's let's start. We got a bunch of people coming on. Let's start talking. So, Todd, hey uh, Richie, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? Good, good. Good to see you. Busy day, huh? Oh yeah. Today was uh, it was uh, it was back to back meetings today. So no loading today. No, nothing out in the field. Just trying but to is build it ever business. not a busy day in the ATM business? Uh, no, not really. Every day, even the Sunday mornings are have been busy lately. You know, especially with uh, tax time, um, seeing the transactions go up. This is always a good time of year for us. You know, we got just got off of St. Patrick's Day. That's always good for us. You know, being being up here in New England, we got a lot of Irish people, and uh, you know, so we got. We had that last weekend. Some bars just really killed it. And then, um, yeah, and just now we're going to run into March Madness. And that that's always good for the bars and and gaming and, and whatnot. Did you do any events? You know, I actually kind of got out of the event thing. Um, I know a couple of my guys did some, some for we have a road race and we have a uh, parade in the next town over. But uh, my kind of my days of events are are over. I kind of pass them along. The uh, I think they're kind of a distraction, and uh, yeah. it is from you know from the bigger prize. Um, I, in in the younger days, they were fun, but uh, they're just I think they're just more of a headache right now for me. But I, I some people do really well at them. You know they 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 hit them they hit them hard. I know uh, the one the guy did one in a tent at the end of the road race. And I think, you know, he did, he did almost 350 transactions, um, you know, in, in that. That's great. But I mean, I I feel the same as you. I don't do events at all ever. I mean, if we get an event that comes in, even if it's for like a FI customer, we still sub it out to somebody else. Yeah. I did do events when I started, but man, that's a lot of work, but I know there's people listening that probably uh, disagree and love events and want to do all the events they can possibly do. There's too much to go wrong too. You have to make your money in a very short period of time. Um, There's, there's one event that we keep. And um, even that last, last year we, we farmed it out. It's a, you know, it's a four day hippie fest. They all camp in the woods and, it's uh, and the transactions go all night long. And the real, only reason I like to keep that is, you know, I really like the uh, event coordinator. He's he's a really good guy and uh, hate to say no. He gives all the money to charity. So you hate to say no to him. But uh, even last year, we farmed that one out. It's great. It's great. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that uh, you kept it because you, you like attending that event. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so now that we have a bunch of people that have jumped on, go ahead, Todd, and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the industry. Yeah. So, um, I started in um, before starting the ATM business. I worked for uh, J.P. Morgan, and uh, part of our part of my job was uh, we managed the EBT program. It was pretty much all government um, prepaid cards. Um, you'd appreciate, you know, one of our products was the, uh, uh, the red cross card, um, during Katrina. So that was, uh, that was one of our products. Um, so, but we managed the, um, the EBT card. And, um, so my, my job was to, was to, um, get access for, for the clients. And, um, in, Early 2001, Elliot Spitzer sued um, J.P. Morgan and Citibank. It was actually Citibank at the time, and said, "Well, you had to put you have to put out ATMs because there's not enough access um, for um, EBT cards to have free access." 
So out of that is that we had to um, we had to deploy 120 ATMs. And um, when we started, we were deploying NCRs and we had, you know, we had um, people running telephone lines, rigging companies. It was horrible. It was uh, I think we had deployed about 70 ATMs, mostly in the Bronx and the Queens. And um, so we, we ran across this guy, Jack O'Toole. I don't know if you know him. He used to run a company called a ISA eCash. And Jack's like, I got a better way. And uh, basically, he described a branding program to us uh, without the branding, is that he would deploy the ATMs and um, and offer surcharge free access and we would pay him. Mm-hmm. And we kind of expanded that program all through New York. And there was one guy that I had run into, John Wildbaker from New York ATM. And uh, John used to call me all the time. Hey, I want more locations. I want more locations because we used to pay them uh, $100 a month plus reimburse their EBT uh, transaction. So it was it was a really good program for them. And, uh, and John would call me all the time. And he's like, oh, you should get into the ATM business. And I'm like, oh, Ah, John, I'm, I, I got a good job. I'm fine. You know, I don't really want to do this, you know. And, um, you know, 2008 came, we hit the um, the banking crisis and we saw, I saw a lot of good people around me get laid off. And uh, I said, well, maybe it's time. And I had a friend of a friend that um, had an ice cream shop. It was a cash only ice cream shop. And we, um, I told John, he's like, hey, John, why don't you put an ATM? No, this is your first location. I remember John saying, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to be in the ATM business, John. And he's like, no, this is, he gave me the ATM. He drove up, installed it, mm-hmm. and uh, we put it on Armor Car. And it, the thing did like a thousand transactions or something like that the first yeah. month. It was, it was, it was you know, and I thought they were all like that. So, um, it, you know, it killed it. And I said, well, this is, this is great. And uh, so I started out getting locations and, uh, you know, John kind of took me under his wing and, uh you know, we've been working together ever since. Um, and uh, that's how I got it and ran the business for about four years from 2008 to 2012. And 2012, um, I was out loading a laundromat. It was like nine, 10 o'clock at night. And I was, I was just burning the candle at both ends. And uh, I, uh, I kind of fell asleep when I fell up, I ran off the highway. Uh, like and I, I ended up in like the median strip and I'm like, this is, I, I can't keep doing both. And next day I gave my notice. I just, it was like, it was like an epiphany moment. Right. And it's like, so I gave my notice and uh, stayed on for another five months and uh, left in 2000, 2013 and New England ATMs grown since then. That's awesome. That's a great story. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. I know a couple of people have heard that before, so they're probably getting tired of it. Oh, it's a great story. <laughs> but when you start off with like your first location being such a good location, it's it gets you oh, fast. It gets yeah, especially that year. I think my raise at JP Morgan was like two thousand dollars, and I made that in one month. You know, and I just remember this is this is like horrible, right? This is like this is this is the greatest thing, and um, so yeah, it just it, you, you get addicted pretty quick, you know. And, and unfortunately, you know, the new guys don't have it as easy as I think, you know, we did when we first started is that the business is much more mature. Um, yep. You know, we I used to walk into convenience stores without ATMs or bars and it was just um, it was a different world. Yeah. And the numbers were crazy back then. Yeah. Yeah, they were. They were. And it, numbers now, I mean, the surcharges were lower. But yeah. the the yeah. volume, the usage was insane. yeah, and and you know at the t- at the time too is like uh, is um, you know banking was a little bit easier, um, but you know machines were a little bit more expensive back then, and uh, it was it was you know it was um, it was tough you know, but you know we we got past it, and uh, the you know the guys now starting is that sometimes I I kind of feel for them because it's kind of hard to get you know to get accounts and. Um, and uh, but they do things that you know when I first started putting an ATM in a barbershop was you know never do that right it would yeah. just never never happen we were always going after the convenience stores the liquor stores the grocery stores and and that type of thing yeah for sure the the bars kind of fallen a bit as far as like yeah. how people want to make as I remember right. at one point there were guys that like if they weren't making at least like five hundred dollars a month on a machine. Back in the day, they wouldn't even touch it. Now I think that number's probably fallen 
probably for some people down to like a hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars, they'll just stick an ATM anywhere if they yeah. can make that. What what's interesting is when I first started, I, I was very bar heavy because I'd get off of work at five o'clock and I would kind of joke is like my second shift would start. And uh, so th the only places that I could really ever get a hold of the owner were the bars. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we ended up putting out a lot of bars um, because of that. You know, the, the convenience store owners, they weren't there. And um, uh, so. So, yeah, we would always I'd always start my uh, my second shift. And I mean, it was nothing for me to come home at like 12 or one, you know, after after hustling, either loading or, or trying to trying to, you know, nail down the owner. And uh, uh, I saw a clip from I think it was your last live with Blake is that you said the one of the, the best things that you did was to put a sales guy on, you know, early on. And yeah. uh I had a, um, you know, I had a guy that started with almost from the beginning, you know, he, he wanted to get into the ATM business. He didn't really have any money. And I said, Hey, listen, just, just go out and get me some accounts. I'll give you a quarter of transaction. And, um, you know, and next thing I know is, you know, I'm cutting him a check every month for $4,000 and it's just, you know, like, you know, we got to, yeah, we didn't, we didn't think that, about the, I had that happen a couple of times where somebody was like, man, if I could just make, you know, two thousand dollars a month. I'll come work for you. And uh, back then, I was like, "Man, I can't pay you two thousand yeah, dollars." Yeah, And right. put them on like some type of uh, share, residual share thing. And next thing you know, they're making way more than two thousand dollars a month. And you're like, "Damn, I should have yeah, yeah. two thousand a month." <laughs> well, then you, you know, you you gotta kind of negotiate what the end is, right? Because it's just it sucks when they're making four thousand dollars a month. They're sitting on a beach, and you're still working your ass off to you know to to pay that four thousand dollars. So yeah. Uh, well, I will say I have guys that started back you know ten years ago on on deals like that. Over ten years ago, maybe like twelve on on deals like that where they got like basically perpetual you know monthly payments, but they're still involved. They still handle yeah. those accounts. If I call them and say, hey, this this account is issued or thinking about leaving, whatever, they'll go over there and handle it. So mm -hmm. to me, it's still worth it if they're willing to do that. Right. If they're willing to be part of the uh the equation yeah. still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have some questions coming in. What's one piece of advice that you would give each other since you come from different eras and grow differently? That's one more sweet. time on the question. I kind of missed that. Yeah. One piece of advice that we would give each other since we both come from a different era and grow differently. Hmm. I, I mean, the piece of advice is, you know, I, I would give, I don't know about you, but I mean, I'd give some of the younger people is just, just start early. You know, I started, I started late. I was, um, I think I was, um, you know, 30, 38 when I started, um, you know, when I started in the business and, uh, it's, um, it, you know, I worked for somebody, I could never go back to work for somebody anymore. And I see, um, you know, I got, I have a guy, Jesse, who, um, has a root and he does some part-time work for me. I mean, he's early thirties and, uh, you know, has a couple apartment buildings. He's, he's killing it, you know? And, um, and he's got the, He's got the advantage of time, which I, I think I got too late because, you know, just kind of like interest, it just compounds and compounds and uh, and you have the value of time. So and I know you started really early, Rich, you know, it's like it, uh, you know. Well, I'd say that because uh, we, we, you know, process for some deployers who are guys that are double my age. And mm -hmm. one piece of advice that I give to these older guys is that. You know, they still like to do everything old school on a handshake. Mm. That's like huge with them. And I, I tell them like, that's, you can't do things that way. Like if you want to, you know, especially if you're older, if you're like 60 years old and you've built up an ATM business and you did everything on a handshake, at some point you're going to want to like retire, I would think, or you might have to once you get too old. And mm. they never thought about that. And they're kind of stuck because they can't really sell their, their portfolio for, a great multiple they because they don't have any contracts and they were like really stuck in this old way of no everything i do is by handshake that's just how we do business in my generation it's like i get it but like it's you know you're 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 gonna really regret it one day if you don't start getting contract and sure enough like that's playing out now with a couple of these guys who i think are 
you know, with the, the changes that we've had and them getting older, they're, they're probably looking to kind of start getting out and mm -hmm. they're realizing they're not going to be able to get that big exit that they always yeah. hoped they would get because they yeah. didn't get, I mean, some of them have no contracts. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of old school like that. I have, you know, unless it's a really big, you know, unless it's a really big account um, that I have a lot invested in, I, I've never been huge on contracts. I just, um, and probably, I mean, to this point it hasn't bit me, but you know, like you said, is that when it becomes the exit plan is that might, might be it. So, but I was, uh, I'm a big kind of no contract guy, you know, and, uh, there's been, there's been moments, you know, there's been moments and they get really, get really mad because, you know, somebody comes in and drops $10,000 on the counter for the, for the merchant and they get greedy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, but for the most part, I'm, I'm not a contract guy. I wasn't in the beginning, the very beginning, like I had none. And then it was very hard to go back and get them on those. Layers. Yeah. Oh, we got better over time. Like there's yeah. definitely well, strategies. I, I, I think when you, you would, you know, with the things like DocuSign and si I use sign now, um, it's, it, I think it's easier to get them than, you know, than Game doing the paper push. So much easier. Game changer. Yeah. Like everything. We do not put out a piece of equipment anymore without a contract. And it's mm. pretty much all DocuSign, like all DocuSign. Mm. It's so much easier because for whatever reason, people, when they sign a DocuSign, I think they just don't look Doesn't at feel it. real. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, it's like, it's kind of like how we agree to the terms when we use our iPhone and we don't even read them. We just hit Excel. Yeah. We right. basically sold our entire life away to Apple. So <laughs> I think that's why. But uh, let's see, more questions. Best approach to landing co-branding deals with banks and credit unions? So, I mean, I, I, I think kind of just asking, right, is the, um, um, it was, I was talking to, John was in the shop today and I was talking to him, you know, like my first year in business, I think it was probably maybe my first or second year in business. I landed a bank agreement, an airport and uh, in a mall. And, uh, and wow. it, honestly, it was, it was just because I, and, and I did more in that first two years as far as those type of accounts than I do now, honestly. I mean, I go after a lot of like, you know, low income neighborhoods and, and whatnot now. But, um, you know, it was just it was just asking. Right. Is just um, uh, I think a lot of the good branding deals, the bank branding deals is, um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce. I had I had met the bank when I first started the bank that we did a branding deal for. Um, they, they were at a in a um, small business incubator. And, and I would attend those. Um, I was actually kind of looking for funding and I was learning from the, the small business incubator. And one of the board members um, was uh, volunteering at the incubator. And, um, and, you know, we started talking and we started talking about branding deals and, um, and we ended up uh, deploying like eight, eight or I think it was eight or nine locations with them. And uh, the contract just ended actually, we, they didn't want to renew the contract. Um, but I, I think they're going to probably come back. We've been, we've been talking and, uh, I kind of, I didn't price it right for myself. And, um, you know, we, we did some complicated, you know, you, they pay for wireless boxes. It was just, it was, it was very complicated. Um, so I think, um, but, but it's just, just getting, putting yourself out there, I think is, is really it. You know, the airport, we answered an RFP. And, uh, you know, we did, we, when I worked at JP Morgan, we worked on a lot of RFP. So I felt very confident about that, but our RFP is pretty much just answering a bunch of questions. Right. And, um, and, and getting that. So yeah, just getting yourself out there and, and talking to people. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that a hundred percent, but it's also having the right locations too. You know, like yeah. you said, having you know, hospitals, airports, transit stations or in, 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 yeah in in my in my bank branding deal um they actually brought me the locations so it was you know they would say oh um and, it, and that was kind of the the frustrating part about it is they'd want to give me locate they want to put me in locations that um you know they I, I remember they um the person i was working with called me once and said hey can we put one in the starbucks and you know at, at the end of this and I said, well, do you know somebody at Starbucks? No, no, go ask them and see if they want to put one in. I'm like, no, I don't, it doesn't work that way, you know? 
why not? You know, so it's like they didn't really understand, but they had they brought me um, some some like couple office buildings that were pretty good. And they brought me a um, believe it or not, they brought me a moose club. That's still one of my best accounts to this day. Really? And, why uh, that? Yeah. They have like bingo I, or what they, they, it's 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 a it's a massive moose club it's just um and they they have gaming um the illegal gaming in the basement and uh but uh and they do they do tons of lottery it's a very very active moose club they just have bingo going they always have something going on you know every night spaghetti dinner bingo something something's going on I and um, i don't have and, any of those i think one yeah, time in, I have a bfw yeah, it, Massachusetts has a very strong lottery system that's cash only. We're, I think we have one of the strongest lotteries in the country. And uh, so if if there's a lottery location, even the Chinese restaurants that do lottery do pretty good in Massachusetts. So really? we're pretty lucky on that. Yeah. We don't have a lot of casinos. We, we, casinos are kind of new for us. And um, we have, I think, four casinos in the state. Um, but so the lottery was always taking that first that, you know, that first position as far as gaming goes. Interesting. Uh, another question, best approach to find bid opportunities for government contracts? Uh, there's a couple services. I think they're kind of expensive, um, but there are some services you can sign up for that'll give you, that'll give you um, the, uh, the, the, li the leads. Um, sometimes it's just constantly Googling them. Um, I do subscribe to a service right now. Um, I think it's called Bid Prime. I think that's it. There's another one. Um, there's a uh, bunch. Find, find our actually the, what I used to do is there's one called find RFP yeah, and no. you, you so you can go there you can and you can just go type in like ATM and you'll see the opportunities that'll pop up but they won't let you see the RFP right so then you could say okay well there's an airport in New Hampshire and then well there's only one airport in New Hampshire so then you go google in it so it's kind of a way around it um, and you know, whatever their pricing is, they are negotiable. I, I found that because when you say no, they call, they keep calling you back and, um, but find RFP is actually a pretty good one. Yeah. We use that one and a few others. We haven't found that there's like any one service that catches everything. So we yeah. pay for a few, some are cheap and some are insanely expensive. I think one of them we pay for is like maybe six or $8,000 a year. Wow. But they none of not any one of them catches everything, and sometimes none of them catch it. So you have to always kind of be looking and hmm. knowing where to look. Uh, what are the five essential tools you need to have to grow your business, such as websites, eight hundred numbers, social media? That's another question we just had. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been I've been uh, I've been playing with SEO lately. Um, that's uh, kind of my, my new thing is, uh, get, you know, we've been doing some Google ads and it's, it's brought in a, a fair amount of, um, a fair amount of leads. I've been, I've actually been pretty, uh, pretty impressed by it is, um, you know, especially in the Northeast, if you're in the Northeast and you, you Google ATMs or you Google, you know, buy an ATM or something like that, we, we have, you know, the, the, the Northeast pretty much locked down. We're, we're in the top three of most everything. Um, you know, we, we actually, I went to go hire an SEO company a couple of weeks ago and they said, there's, there's really nothing we can do for you. Cause you're already up there. And so I'm like, well, I guess I did pretty good. He mm -hmm. says, if you want to do it nationally and, uh, you know, I wasn't ready for that. It's like new England ATM doesn't really resonate outside of the Northeast. You know, everybody just wants to talk about the Patriots and how much they hate them. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, um, but the, um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think eventually if I go national, I'd have a different branding than, mm -hmm. than New England ATM. But but it, on the SEO side, it does help um, because, you you know, you ATMs in New England and um, and, uh, you know, Google puts that symmetrics. To, uh, I think it's called what symmetrics together with the uh, like if Massachusetts equals New England. And so you get you get some pretty good, um, pretty good flow that way. Yeah. So SEO, which I've never gotten deep into, but you definitely have to have, you know, to, going back to this original question, you definitely have to have a website and you should yeah. put your website on all your ATMs and your signs and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, social media to me is more of like a, a reach out game. I don't think it's just about posting. You actually need to be like DMing businesses and 
adding businesses and following them and stuff on on social media but you could also do sem you know where you can buy ads in the search engines i know a lot of our competitors do that and i guess they get results there's a company down here i swear for like at least 10 years has been paying to be on on paid google search ads so hmm. i don't think they would keep doing yeah, we, it we we only spend uh we spend about 300 bucks a month and we seem to get a return out of it so it's uh and i don't spend a lot but it still you know gets us towards the top on on certain keywords that i just can't get on the top for but uh and they're good yeah. quality leads that you're getting? Um, I mean, you get, a, you get a little bit of everything. Um, I, I actually have a company do it. So uh, I know when I tried to do it, I used to get like calls. Is this Bank of America? You know, I lost my card in the Bank of America ATM. And so you'd just, you'd get, you'd just get really, you know, crap calls that way. But um, how, however this company is doing it, they, um, they, they seem to get, you know, a good, a good mix of, of what comes in. And unfortunately, I can't. I don't really have the um, um, the determination whether it's coming in through SEO or through the. And I probably should probably break that down a little bit, but uh, you know, I just know it's coming in through the website. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Uh, Blake was asking, "What is your favorite kind of location?" And it doesn't have to be the most profitable one. Just what's your most favorite kind? Um, I'm going to say, uh, I, I have a, I have a couple of check cashers that, um, I, I just like the guys. They seem to be down to earth. I mean, they just seem to be, um, I have a couple bars, which, um, you know, they're just, they're just, they're kind of just like understanding if something happens like, oh yeah, get to it when you get to it, you know, just, just want to let you know the ATM was out of service. And, you know, that then, you know, the, some of the convenience stores, you know, you, you got to get there right away. You think, you know, you think that um, that it, their life's coming to an end or something, right? You know, so and it's it, terrible. There's a, there's always there's always five people that try to use the ATM in the last hour that it's out, right? So it's like I was I always picture there's this car with five people driving around looking for ATMs that are broken, and, it's, and then they stand in line, you know. So, it's, <laughs> but yeah, my favorite. I think my favorites, like historically, my favorite was probably always hotels because no news is mm -hmm. good. If you do a good job, you never hear from them. They don't change. They don't really care about how much money they make off, off the ATM. It's like there for their guests and just keep it up and running and they leave you alone. Everybody's happy and they're safe. Like I've never, yeah. had, I've never had a hotel ATM broken into or anything. We, we used to load an ATM for you in Hartford and, uh, you know, I, I used to love going there, right? It's just, yeah. uh, you know, it was, it was safe. You could, you know, I used to pull right up to the front door, you know, and just run in, load it. It was, uh. Parking, parking at hotels is always easy. I mean, even in the French Quarter, like where it's impossible to park, all these hotels have valets and stuff. So you just pull up, you make friends with the valet, you pull up, you run in. They don't do what they used to do, but they are safe locations for sure. And yeah. they're, they're easy to get to and they don't bother you. The machine Your ATM doesn't get beat up. You know, that's they're clean. They don't get beat up. Nobody does, you know, on Bourbon Street. I mean, you can imagine some of the things we've seen people do to ATMs. That stuff doesn't happen inside of the hotels. So I like hotels uh, a lot. That's always kind of been my favorite. Uh, another question. Run Dash Cash asks, do you like Bank One? Do I like Bank One? Yeah. I don't know who Bank One is. I'm not sure why. They I don't know who Bank One is. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. Do you have any cash only uniform stores? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Me neither. I've never even heard of a cash only uniform store. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Do you ever worry about the trend of society going towards cashless? And how would you plan to adjust for this? I don't, you know, I get that question asked a lot. I don't, I mean, I, I'm not really worried about it. I, I guess, um, you know, if you look at year to year on transactions, you can see a little bit of a dip. You, know, you just keep building the pie a little bit bigger. Um, I'm 53. So just, you know, I think it's, I think cash will take me at least till my retirement. And then I don't have to worry about it. So I don't know about, you know, some of the younger guys, if it's going to still be there. Um, but, uh, I, I honestly think, you know, if Bitcoin takes over the world is uh, the credit cards have more to worry about than we do. 
um, that honestly is, uh, yeah. I mean, I think as long as there's, um, you know, as long as there's people that don't want to pay taxes, do drugs and, um, uh, cash will be there. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, our, our low income neighborhoods still do very good. Um, they don't trust, you know, low income people don't trust banks and, uh, yeah. Well, our volume, we see it fall a little every year, other than the uptick that some people saw during COVID on the, you know, convenience stores and stuff. But overall, we see a tick down, tick down, tick down. But what we do to counteract that, you know, you raise surcharges, you rework your deals with the with the locations. Mm -hmm. And there's new ways to make money, like there's branding and there's other little things you can do. Credit card cash advance, DCC. We do a ton of DCC with with all the travel locations. So there there's new income streams that didn't exist yeah. back in the day. I think I think the branding in the next couple of years is going to be a real big um, you know, the, the banks are just realizing it's just too expensive to put these ATMs out. And, uh, you know, we're, we see it all the time. Bank of America is taking ATMs off the streets. And uh, and I think that, you know, small some of the smaller branch banks have some real opportunity to, um, you know, to to get their name out through branding. And I think it's going to keep that piece is going to keep growing. Definitely. Yeah. Branding for us is just huge. Like and it's it's getting bigger and bigger and outsourcing both but they kind of you know they're all related so right. you get, you get branding you end up getting some outsourcing okay last couple questions what is the pay structure for location sales reps um i i the sales rep that i've had is we've done a um on a per transaction basis uh usually do a quarter um and um and then i've i've done it over like a three-year a three-year um fallout is that um you know that it, it reduces over the course of time over the three years and uh, they they have to kind of act as i mean they don't have to go fix the machine but they have to act as kind of an account rep to mm -hmm. um to make sure that you know that customer's happy and um and that's that's usually how we how we've paid the salespeople. I don't have any like salaried uh, salespeople on right now, but it's all been done through um, uh, commission shares. Yeah. So for us, we have like two different models. You have the affiliate type who's really like an independent who gets, like you said, kind of like a residual. Same thing we do with towers and stuff. If somebody goes out, signs up a location, they get they get uh, basically a you know lifetime residual or or long-term residual at least on on most of our affiliate deals and they still kind of act stay somewhat involved right but for reps who actually get a salary that's a little different because they get a base and they have a quota and then the way they get paid commission is like this formula that takes into account both profitability and length of contract the longer the contract the more to get paid and more profitable the more to get paid now you don't know how much they're gonna how profitable location is going to be until you put it in. So right. if we pay it out, it gets paid out over the first couple months based upon, you know, how long the contract was and everything. So it's a formula that over the years we came up with just because there were so many ways. I mean, sales reps, you know, I love them, but they always find a way to game the system. So if you pay them <laughs> flat 500 bucks, they're going to go sign up everything that you don't want. And so you have to, you have to make it, where they're incentivized to get you a contract. So in our case, like they have to get a contract, the longer the contract, the more to get paid that we're incentivized not to just give up easily and sign a short one when, when somebody negotiates and they're incentivized to get us as much margin as possible, because if, if they uh, don't get much margin, they won't make much. Right. So that's, that's how we do it. And it just was trial and error of, of people gaming, whatever we came up with and, no, it must be a hell of a spreadsheet, Richie. Yeah, you got to put all those numbers in, right? To, to figure it out. It's not too bad now because we we use and and you're you're pretty advanced, so you might do something like this too. Like we use a macro and we pull all of our data out of the processors and we run a PL on every single location. Hmm. So like we can see every month a PL of every location, how much it brought in, what we paid the loader. We see everything: the DCC, the CCA, the interchange all the fees that we pay, what we paid the location, what we paid the loader, um, what we paid the reps, everything. We can see all of that. So we use that PL to then 
you know, pay these reps. Uh, the margin gotcha. automatically calculate it anyway. Yeah, I'm not that advanced. So that's uh that seems uh I don't I'd like to have that, you know, PL for each location, but I I don't do that. But that's how we calculate our payments and then we yeah. that all goes into a you know, it, it spits out like a, a a tab, right? Like an Excel that has all the payments. And then mm -hmm. we import that into our payment system. We use Melio. And then Melio either does a ACH or mails a check for us. And then mm -hmm. they they integrate with QuickBooks. So all of these payments load into QuickBooks. Right, right. I didn't know you could import into Melio. That's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Either so you don't import into it, QuickBooks and then that goes to Melio? It goes or one, of, one of those ways, yeah. Oh, but okay. they're, either way, in, Melio and QuickBooks are integrated together. Right. So if you go put a payment into Melio, like it'll go into QuickBooks. Gotcha, gotcha. Do you use Melio too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we do, we pay our vendors um, off of that. We don't, we don't really pay our merchants off of it. Um, either the merchants are direct or we cut a check. Um, you know, we're still cutting like almost 200 checks a month, which yeah. is... It, you know, we have Melio, check writing. Melio sends the check for you if you let them do the checks. Of yeah, it yeah. used to be free though. The, the the problem that I haven't been able to solve is how does the merchant get the uh, the statement at the same time? It's just, I mean, they, you know, I guess you could do it through the, the processor's email, yeah, right? We did that in the macro. So oh, okay. the macro, so we have every location, we look, we put their email address for for whoever gets their statements. And we just hit one button after we close out all of the, the end of the month stuff and boom, it just sends everybody their statement hmm. by email. Hmm. I guess I'm going to make a trip to New Orleans to see what you, how you do that. That's okay. <laughs> Come on. Uh, and let's see, the only other question we have left is, I, I don't no. quite understand it, but I think what they're asking is, are we, are we worried about bars not taking cash or not needing cash anytime soon? Um, I mean, I think the bars that have gone, um, they've, they've already, they've already gone. I mean, I have, I have a few cash only, uh, bars and they're very, very good. Um, I, I just, you know, if those bars get sold, I could see that, that policy changing, but the bars that are cash only, I mean, those guys are cash only for a reason. So yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, there's a few bars here that have actually gone cashless, but a, a lot of them still. Yeah. The um, once, once again, the thing that we have in Massachusetts, a lot of the bars have lottery, you know, we, and, um, and lottery in Massachusetts is cash only. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it's still, you know, they either have lottery vending machines or they have Kino um, and, uh, you know, the Kino, if you see that Kino sign, it's a good location in Massachusetts. Yeah. We, our bars here don't, don't sell lottery. I didn't know any bars at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. We just had an, a last final question. Uh, okay. somebody said, do we send statements if they don't ask? I mean, we always in the setup process ask for their email for their statements. Now, if they don't give us one that we have nowhere to send it, but we do always give that and in fact some merchants you know they they say well we don't know about this because you're sending the statement and all so how do we know it's accurate so we just give them a, a login to the processor so yeah. they can go in and I, verify yeah i i can't tell you how many times over the years i've been able to get a location because the location tells me i don't ever get a statement i think they're screwing me you know and uh, so we always always and they are they yeah. are a lot yeah. of times so I tell them like if they're not sending you a statement and they won't give you a statement, they won't give you a, even if they give you a statement, if they won't give you a login, yeah. then you know that they're messing with the numbers. And yeah. we've seen we've caught people doing that here many yeah, times. We, we're talking to a barbershop right now, and the guy says, I get a hundred dollar check every single month. And and he goes, I don't know how he goes, I'm supposed to be getting like 50 cents a transaction, and every month I get a hundred dollar check. He goes, I don't know how that happens, you know, like a I can tell you how it happens, right? So I think, you know, I, I hopefully we're going to land that one. But, uh, you know, the guy just, he just feels like he's getting screwed. Well, before we wrap up, Todd, did you also want to mention anything about your new topper program? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been working on it. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it. Let's, I got to turn my, uh, there we go. We've been, we've been working on the, um, the toppers. Uh, let's see if I can do this here. Um, kind of taking a little bit different approach, uh, where we worked with, um, 
worked with a company to get it's a, a nice 18 and a half inch tablet. It's a little bit bigger than uh, some of the Scepter TVs that are out there. It's brighter. Uh, we had a metal shop uh, make a custom uh, uh, bracket. So it looks like, looks like I also made bracket I've seen. That's yeah, a great looks um, and you know it makes it look like Hyosung kind of made the bracket, and uh, you know we it's an all-in-one unit. We don't have any wires coming out of the back of it, um, and uh, you know we've been rolling it out. We have um, I think we have forty screens out right now. Um, not really making any money yet, but um, we we teamed up with a local newspaper um, to in, they're going to be selling to uh, to the screens. A little bit different approach, I think. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, people in the digital signage and they said, all the ATM guys want to do is put a screen on and, and make money and not do anything else. And, uh, so, you know, hopefully we're going to, you know, sell local ads and, um, uh, and just have a little bit qual more quality product where hopefully we can attract those ads also. So. Yeah. So anybody who's watching, you know, we're always getting asked about toppers, toppers, toppers. And I see in a Facebook group all the time, people ask for toppers and, you know, not to say anything negative about anybody out there, but there's a lot of people out there that are just pushing these topper programs that, that don't really work and don't, don't, they really don't care if it works for you. They just want you to buy the topper and if they can make a dollar off of it, then it's, you know, they're happy. Whereas, you know, with Todd, you know, Todd actually cares. And uh, I'm, I also do some some media stuff with some uh, digital signage. So, like, I kind of understand the industry and, like, everything Todd's doing and everything we're talking about. Like, I think he's taking the right path, the better path. So, you know, if you're looking for toppers, I, I'd say Todd's the way to go. Hmm. Not quite there yet to start selling them, but I think we're going to be close, hopefully. Hopefully soon. So um, Yeah, but that, that's what's good, that you're not just, yeah. like, throwing them out there and, telling everybody yeah. to do it before we're, you're ready. we're you know in our area we're trying to hit um uh you know a spanish uh niche and uh just trying to get um you know we have a we have a sales guy out in the field that's uh he's he he's ex goya rep and he can he knows all the spanish guys i know we uh you know we working with you and getting some of the towers out the door and uh you know i think uh we i think we're working on number 7 and 8 right now so yeah it's a it's a tower takeover man up there and yeah 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 yes yeah. so i guess i'm gonna have to come visit with that many towers going there i'm gonna have to fly up <laughs> to absolutely to absolutely we're gonna try to get one in the basketball hall of fame there's a the basketball hall of fame is right behind us so oh nice that will be cool yeah that will be cool well todd i appreciate it can you let Thank everyone you. know how to reach you where to find you if they want to follow you yeah i mean i mostly on uh I, I know uh, Yuli tried to get me on uh, Instagram. That wasn't a, in, I, I didn't answer her. So that, uh, but Facebook, um, you know, is uh, we have the Facebook startup group. Uh, um, and that's, uh, that's, you know, if you're interested in the ATM business, a lot of good stuff on there. Um, and uh, you know, get me at that and uh, New England ATM .net. When I started, I didn't get the .com. I own it now, but uh, New England ATM .net, and You can reach out to me there. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate everybody tuning in today and we'll have another live for you guys soon. All right. Thanks, Richie. I appreciate it. Thanks, Todd.